Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Albert Chen of the Faculty of Law here at University of Hong Kong, and on behalf of our Center of Chinese Law, uh, I would like to welcome all of you here uh, to this uh, evening lecture, evening talk, by a very distinguished uh, speaker and a, and a very old friend of our law school, Professor Jerome Cohen, uh, who is uh, uh, from New York University School of Law. Uh, and he is visiting Hong Kong and mainland China and Taiwan. Uh, and we're very uh, honored and privileged that uh, he is able to come here to our law school to give the lecture this evening. Uh, so actually, Professor Cohen needs no introduction. But still, uh, I think uh, I should introduce him. Uh, as a former teacher of mine, uh, I, I studied at Harvard Law School in the early 80s, and, uh, and Professor Cohen was my teacher of uh, Chinese law. Uh, and um, he subsequently went into full-time practice. And after retiring uh, from practice, uh, he taught uh, at uh, New York University Law School, where he's still a uh, professor. Uh, and also, uh, he is the, um, the uh, director, the, uh, the faculty director of the U.S. Asia Law Institute of New York University Law School. And um, actually, the executive director of uh, the U.S. Asia Law Institute, uh, Professor Ira Belkin, is also with us today. Uh, and welcome also to Professor Belkin. So as you all know, Professor Cohen uh, is a pioneer of the study of Chinese law uh, in the U.S. Uh, I think he began his studies of Chinese law and, and, and Chinese matters in the 1960s. Um, he, he, he is writing his memoirs, uh, and uh, one, of his, one of the chapters of his memoirs, which, uh, which is about his experience in Hong Kong in the 1960s, uh, where he uh, started to uh, interview people and collect materials relating to Chinese law. Uh, and uh, this chapter of his memoirs will soon be published uh, in the uh, Hong Kong Law Journal, the journal edited uh, by uh, our, our faculty. So I hope uh, you, you all have the chance to read um, that chapter and may, may many other chapters of Professor Cohen's interesting memoirs in the foreseeable future. Um, actually, Professor Cohen's research interests uh, extend far beyond the Chinese law. Uh, it, they, it, they also include East Asian law, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, and, and other, uh, uh, Vietnam and other East Asian legal systems uh, have also been his areas of research interest. Uh, and uh, as far as Chinese law is concerned, his research interests also extend to all areas of Chinese law, commercial and civil and procedural and criminal law and human rights. And today, um, his talk uh, is about some aspects of human rights, uh, not only uh, human rights in mainland China, but also in Hong Kong uh, and uh, Taiwan. Uh, so the, the exact title is China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So uh, it's my great privilege and honor to uh, invite uh, Professor Cohen to, to start his speech. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> it, it would have been hard to predict 36 years ago when Albert was at Harvard Law School that we'd end up here today. And I'm happy that uh, we can do this. It's always a pleasure to come here uh, I think about nine years ago, I told the story that some of you may remember. Uh, I first talked at Hong Kong University uh, in 1961. Uh, it was my ending my first year of study of China and Chinese language. I was at Berkeley. Uh, out of the blue comes an invitation to speak at the 50th anniversary of Hong Kong University, a very eminent occasion. 
I couldn't figure out why in the world did they invite me? I hadn't published anything about China. I was just a beginner. I'd never been to Asia, but I accepted. And I came here, and as soon as I got here, I discovered why they had invited me. People came up and congratulated me on the books I had done on the economy of China and Japan. <laughs> and of course, I hadn't done those books. And they discovered I was Jerome A. Cohen, <laughs> not Jerome B. Cohen, <laughs> who was 25 years my senior. And of course, when I got up to speak, I had to make full disclosure and said I hadn't done any of these things, but I was very happy to be here. <laughs> I had hoped to be invited, even though I knew I wouldn't be because of my criticisms of China and human rights, to the 100th anniversary in 2011, because then my wife and I would have been the only people to have attended both the 50th and the 100th anniversaries. But, as they say in the mainland, Jungjir Gua Shui, politics is in command, and I think I was too radioactive to take part in the 100th anniversary here. I don't think I'll wait for the 150th. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, I'm an optimist, and to show you how optimistic I am, at my age, I just got a 10-year visa to visit China. <laughs> It's very, wise, it's very wise decision of the Chinese government, whoever uh, made the decision. I don't know, but I just came yesterday from China where we had some very interesting meetings, both on international law of the sea and on domestic law. And I'm happy to see that despite the enactment and implementation of the new law regarding foreign NGOs, that a lot of cooperation continues and will continue. And that leads to my selection of the topic of the day, which you may think is a little odd. But I wanted to see whether we could take another look at the International Covenant on the civil and political rights. The covenant is just a piece of paper. Is it worth anything? Um, China recently dismissed the arbitration decision in the Philippine case against China as just a piece of paper. And what does it think about the ICCPR and why in the world did it sign it uh, in 1998? And that's sort of the question. Of course, this is a question I think should be considered seriously uh, in Hong Kong as well as uh, on the mainland because, as you know, uh, the declaration, the joint declaration between the UK uh, and China with respect to Hong Kong and the basic law both guarantee the protection of the ICCPR to the people of Hong Kong. And the question is, what is it worth if it's a meaningless piece of paper or if it's something that people can rely upon in terms of their expectations for the protection of basic rights. Of course, the ICCPR is one of the most fundamental documents with respect to international human rights. It follows the UN Charter of 1945. It uh, follows the Universal Declaration on uh, Human Rights of uh, 1948, passed by the General Assembly, and it took 18 more years to achieve agreement uh, among the party states to the content of the ICCPR. Uh, the Kuomintang government of Chiang Kai-shek uh, was an early signer in 1966, but was ousted from the UN in 1971, before it got around to ratifying and depositing the ratification with the UN. The PRC, of course, replaced the KMT government in October 71, 
but took a long time to consider signing, uh, not just ratifying, but signing uh, initially uh, this important uh, document. Uh, finally, uh, after uh, many years of consideration, uh, it did sign in 1998, and we've been waiting now 19 years to see whether uh, it will ratify or accede to uh, this convention and make it effective with respect to uh, China. Obviously, uh, this may have great significance for Hong Kong. I'll focus today on mainland China, but I'll make a number of remarks that are relevant to Hong Kong and then finish with some brief remarks about Taiwan, which is another distinctive uh, jurisdiction uh, as far as the ICCPR goes. Before beginning as an American, I have to confess that uh, I'm not here uh, to tell you uh, do as we do. Uh, it took the US a long time to decide to sign the ICCPR and a very long time uh, to ratify it. And when it did so, it did so with many reservations and uh, declarations uh, and uh, trying to put uh, limits on the application of a number of the provisions in the ICCPR. And this isn't the time to go into the limits of the US commitment or the way we have implemented it, but uh, I think it's time uh, to recognize that the US has uh, some way to go, even though we have for many years now uh, adhered to uh, this very important convention. Uh, for Hong Kong, uh, it's, I think, uh, perhaps an exploitable uh, instrument of protecting the people of Hong Kong uh, against any future uh, depredation by the central government uh, that might be deemed harmful to Taiwan's uh, political and civil rights, but we can consider that after I run through some of the basic content uh, of the uh, treaty. The, uh, so many questions. As I said, the basic question is why in the world did the PRC decide to sign up, even if not yet, to ratify? Um, and when we go through, as I'll briefly go through the content uh, of the uh, ICCPR, you'll wonder also, what were people thinking uh, in Beijing when they signed on to this? The preamble is important, especially in light of the current ideological debate, or I can't even say debate because debate has been quelled, but concern for in the mainland of uh, freedom of expression and uh, trying to make a society that uh, has freedom from fear. Because the preamble expresses the ideal of free human beings enjoying civil and political freedom and freedom from fear. It makes clear it's a document for everyone. It's universal. It's not limited to Westerners or Western values. And that's an important point because, as you know, in the mainland today, Western values um, are frequently under attack. And despite the various treaties that the PRC is it adhered to, that uh, the PRC leadership often acts like it's free to define human rights and the need to protect human rights in its own way as though there's nothing universal uh, about them. Uh, Article 1 is very important to the people of Hong Kong and others. Uh, as you know, uh, it says, all peoples have the right of self-determination to freely determine their political status. 
Well, are the people of Hong Kong a people? Uh, how do you define people? Uh, are they distinct from the rest of the Chinese people for purposes of Article 1? This comes up in a more glaring way, of course, with respect to Tibet and with respect to uh, the Uyghur people of Xinjiang and even Mongolian people and others, perhaps. It's a very important question with respect to Taiwan. These are not mere theoretical questions anymore. These are actionable political uh, disputes. China, understandably, is concerned about territorial integrity. Self-determination is notorious for being a vehicle for breaking up the integrity of a country. And so the question arises, is Article I meaningful? And it occurs in the companion treaty of uh, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights also, which China has adhered to, China has ratified and has, to the extent it deems appropriate, put into effect. China, it should be pointed out, has uh, adhered to, I think, more human rights treaties than the United States. Um, certainly, it committed itself in 1988 uh, to the Convention uh, Against Torture and other cruel and unusual punishment, etc. So it raises a question, why did they not ratify this agreement like the uh, others? Uh, Article 2 talks not about peoples, but about individuals. Uh, China, before, long before reacquiring control over Hong Kong, was concerned that Hong Kong might be treated like other colonial jurisdictions. And as soon as China got in the UN in 1971, it moved toward erasing Hong Kong from the list of non-self-governing territories that were eventually expected to come to independence or at least to be able to vote on what their political uh, future could be. And in 1972, uh, the UN at China's behest removed Hong Kong from the list of non-self-governing territories in a very significant uh, action. And I remember Ambassador Huang Hua, later foreign minister and a very able person whom I knew quite well, uh, he argued that uh, Chinese do not have to vote to make it clear that they're Chinese. In other words, no right to vote. And uh, you're living with the consequences here now. But Article 2 is about individuals. And it guarantees human rights to all persons, regardless of their political opinion. And moreover, it's not just a hollow principle that's enunciated, but it guarantees effective remedies for violation of their rights and guarantees the enforcement of those remedies. And anyone who's been involved, as I have in many cases in China in trying to help people whose human rights are being violated, knows the feeling of helplessness that you have. Because where do you go? Who can help? What can you do? What agency is open? And Article 2, when you read it in that light, uh, of course, is important. Most of the human rights in the uh, covenant uh, have no exceptions. But a few do have exceptions, but those exceptions are narrowly drawn to uh, times of declared public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Well, what are the key rights, first of all, with respect to criminal justice? Because most of my experience in China with human rights cases involves really criminal justice, even though criminal justice is the consequence of the suppression of the other rights in the covenant about freedom of expression, freedom of religion, etc. I'll just make some comments going through uh, 
some of the most pertinent, not all of the provisions on criminal justice. And first is, of course, the right to life and the limits that the covenant puts on the death penalty. And uh, China has made some progress toward reducing the number of cases in which the death penalty is decreed and implemented, but we have no details. It's a little bit like we used to suffer looking at the Soviet Union's production of economic factors. They would say, this year we're doing 50% better than last year, but they never told you what last year was. And we're told here that China has significantly reduced executions, but we're also told that to learn how many executions still take place uh, is a state secret. So it suggests a considerable sensitivity with respect to the right to life. No torture, the covenant says, uh, and we know, as I said, China has not only ratified the Convention Against Torture, but it has taken steps to legislate some protections uh, to implement the prohibitions of torture in the covenant. Uh, but many of those uh, steps are inadequate or could be improved upon in terms of legislation. And we know that in practice, torture remains a huge problem. Uh, in China, and that implicates other rights, like how long they can detain you, and we'll talk about that uh, in a second. When you get to Article 9, that's one of the key provisions, uh, because Article 9 concerns liberty of the person. And this is maybe the part that I'm so much interested in because of the importance of protecting people from arbi arbitrary detention. No one should be subjected to arbitrary arrest or detention. And China, even now, struggles with how to apply that. What does that mean? Uh, most recently, we've witnessed the beginnings of an effort to clean up the Chinese Communist Party's preference for secret detention, at least of its 90 million members. Uh, through Xuanwei, uh, the double designation which gives the party with no legal authority uh, the power to detain people for corruption or violation of party discipline or party policy, uh, etc. We're witnessing now an uh, experiment underway to try to provide at least a legitimate fig leaf uh, by transforming the party's uh, incommunicado detention powers uh, to uh, being administered by the government under the Ministry of Supervision, the Jen uh, Bu, which is the same thing as the Party Discipline Inspection Commission. They share offices, they wear the same hats. But if they act in the name of the government, it looks better than the party just punishing people by keeping them indefinitely with no legal protection under uh, incommunicado detention, no right to counsel, no right to see friends. Uh, I think Wang Qishan, who's a very intelligent uh, person, sees that in the party's quest for legitimacy and continuing quest for soft power abroad as well as at home. They have to make this look more legitimate, and they're going to have uh, tests, pilot projects in three jurisdictions in China, and it will include a uh, very significant change, I won't say reform, by taking all of the anti-corruption prosecutors away from the procuracy that Jen Taiyuan and integrating them into this new uh, commission that will be called the Supervisory Commission. This may require even a domestic constitutional amendment, and it's certainly uh, decimating the procuracy. Some people in China were joking uh, that uh, if this reform, this pilot project goes through, uh, 
there'll be nothing left in the procuracy except waste baskets. Uh, be, I think that's, of course, a gross exaggeration, but it is a very significant change. In other words, this is the latest attempt to provide some kind of a, a protection to what the party is doing in terms of uh, arbitrary detention. Of course, the UN has often criticized China, uh, the working group uh, against arbitrary detention in countless cases has condemned uh, what the Chinese government has done to individuals, but they don't generate much publicity. And maybe that's part of the problem with the ICCPR that it doesn't generate much publicity, and that's one of the reasons I thought it'd be a good topic to raise uh, with you uh, today. Uh, let's just go on for a few more of these uh, protections that are provided in Article 9. Anyone detained on criminal charge must be promptly before, uh, brought before a judicial power. Well, uh, that isn't happening in China. Uh, people aren't being brought promptly. You could say bringing people uh, before the procuracy for approval of an arrest warrant after 30 days uh, may meet that. But more and more what we're seeing is the party is resorting to another provision of the criminal procedure, residential surveillance, which allows them six months to hold somebody before deciding whether to put them in the regular criminal process, which would then start the clock running, giving the police 30 more days. So it'd be seven months and the prosecutor another seven days to approve a request for uh, arrest. Residential surveillance is being used more and more I first became interested in it when my friend, the artist Ai Weiwei, was detained in April 2011 and held for, I think, 81 days. They could have kept him longer. And we saw there was no legitimacy, even a violation of the Ministry of Public Security's own rules, which prohibited the police from putting in their house, not in the person's house, uh, someone who has a residence in their city. They were supposed to give them residential surveillance in their own home, like house arrest is normally done. But instead, the police often like to give them house arrest in the house of the police, uh, and not in a conventional detention house even, which has its own problems but in a specially designated place, what our CIA would call a safe house, uh, which means it's not safe uh, for the people who suffer uh, the uh, detention. Uh, and how long can they keep people? Article 9 says it shall not be generally the rule that awaiting trial, that persons awaiting trial should be held in custody. In other words, it means if you're detained or arrested, you shouldn't generally be held until your case comes to trial. You should have bail of some kind. And of course, uh, in China, that isn't the general rule. The general rule is the opposite, despite some efforts to uh, alter that. It also says uh, anyone detained is entitled to court proceedings to test the lawfulness of detention. Habeas corpus is an example of that. If you feel somebody's been arbitrarily detained, can you go to court and get a remedy, or at least a review? And that isn't possible in China. It's the feeling of helplessness that you have in such circumstances that I found uh, very affecting. It provides for victims of unlawful arrest or detention are entitled to compensation. And China recognizes that in principle and in practice often, although the compensation is often uh, very uh, inadequate. 
at least you know something's happening there. They are making an effort. The other major provision on criminal justice uh, is Article 14, which says there's a right to a fair and public hearing by an independent, impartial tribunal, normally open to the public. Now, that just doesn't happen in China. Of course, uh, by the time somebody gets to court, they come before a tribunal that is not independent of political authority. It certainly isn't impartial. And uh, it usually, at least in any case of sensitivity, uh, will do uh, the party's bidding or the bidding of local authorities. And often what purports to be an open trial isn't open at all. Uh, excuses are made constantly uh, why people aren't allowed to attend and why attendance is limited. One thing that they're making a real effort to implement is that decisions of the court should be made public. And in most cases, they are now trying, if it's not a sensitive case, even to make uh, cases available through the media. And you can watch uh, trials uh, occurring, and this is commendable, but of course you'd want to know on what basis are these cases selected. China has about 12 million cases a year. It's a huge number, and maybe a million, even if they can show a million to the public, that's a huge task, but it leaves most cases uh, still not made available to the public. You have other questions. There's a right to be presumed innocent. And certainly that hasn't, even at the level of principle, taken place. Uh, the accused is supposed to be allowed adequate time and facilities to prepare his or her defense. That is often not the case. Uh, there's a right to choose your own lawyer and communicate with your own counsel and you should be notified of the right you have to counsel if it's important for justice in the case. And of course, that's not happening. Accused in sensitive cases aren't allowed to choose their own lawyers. Sometimes their lawyers are locked up, prevented from taking part, and the counsel appointed for them are people under the thumb of the local government and party. I should tell you, January 24th is designated by some important European uh, lawyers' organizations as the Day of the Endangered Lawyer. And I hope increasingly people will mark that day because uh, many of the most outspoken lawyers in China uh, are endangered. Not all of them are locked up. But some of my best friends, as they say, are locked up now in China. Others are disbarred or otherwise prevented from continuing their work. Uh, some flee into exile and aren't, aren't permitted back uh, into the country. There's a right to examine witnesses that are against you and to present your own witnesses on the same terms. There is an effort in law to have witnesses come to court. Normally, they have not come to court. Their testimony is read out in court. That's based on pretrial examination, which is usually in the absence of the defense. And uh, it's hard to get witnesses, especially police who are involved, to come to court. I remember a case in which uh, I was consulted by the New York Times of one of its staff uh, who'd been accused of leaking state secrets. He also accused him of uh, accepting money to try to pervert, pervert the course of justice. And uh, we asked for the right. This was in Beijing in the uh, uh, intermediate court. This wasn't out in the boondocks. And we asked for the right to cross-examine the prosecution witnesses. And the court said, it's not necessary. Well, then we said, at least give us the right to present our own witnesses. 
And the court said, that would be unfair. <laughs> How can you allow the defense to have witnesses come to court if the prosecution doesn't have witnesses come to court? Well, with that kind of logic, you wonder in our kind of never-never land. And uh, it vividly showed me the need for some observance of the provisions of this great treaty. And of course, China has sort of fudged on the question of whether you can be compelled to testify against yourself. It looks like one provision seems to work in that uh, to that end, but it's contradicted by others. And finally, let me just mention on criminal justice, Article 15. Uh, there should be no conviction if the act for which you're convicted has not yet been made a crime. But that's rendered mean meaningless by the use of very vague terms. So, you know, if you're charged with uh, disturbing uh, the peace, anything the police can put under that deprives you of the right to know in advance what kind of conduct, conduct really disturbs the peace. So China is a very long way from being subjected to scrutiny about whether it lives up to these protections. And I don't see, despite continuing progress at the technical level in some respects, uh, I don't see any imminent prospect that it will meet these standards. I should say some of the Chinese reforms are reported very well in uh, Susan Finder's Supreme People's Court Monitor, which does a wonderful job of following what reforms are made and what happens to them. It's not a hopeless situation. There are hundreds of thousands of people in various parts of the legal profession in China who are really disturbed by the current leadership and who are trying within the limits of the politically possible and trying to stay out of jail, nevertheless quietly, to continue the work of reform trying to make the exclusion of illegally seized evidence or evidence taken by torture, trying to make that a living thing, trying to make the protections that have appeared in Chinese law uh, a reality. And one of the reasons that I'm here today is, uh, of course, these people deserve our respect and support, and they don't want to feel let down. Uh, even though they're engaged in a time of real difficulty uh, because uh, they have a leadership that at least half the time uh, admonishes people just to do the party's will and to ignore or reject the kinds of universal values that this treaty deals with. Of course, the treaty, as I said earlier, deals with more than criminal justice. Uh, it deals with freedoms of expression, freedom of travel. Uh, you have to be free to choose your own residence. China keeps struggling to get rid of the hukou system that restricts people's residence, it leads to the immigration problem in various cities, migrant labor and all that. Uh, you're supposed to, under Article 12, be free to leave the country. And this is interesting. There shall be no arbitrary deprivation of the right to enter your own country, to go back. But of course, the question is, what is an arbitrary deprivation? Many people I know can't go back to China. And uh, they'd like to be able to go, even at the risk of, of being detained and prosecuted. Of course, freedoms of expression, uh, not just religion, but the right to hold opinions, to seek, receive uh, impartial uh, information and ideas. There are certain narrow exceptions for national security, public order, public health, and morals. 
but you're supposed to be generally free to have opinions and to express them and to assemble peaceably. As you know, there's been in recent years a very, very great repression of the right to people to get together, even in their own homes. I have a friend who, a Chinese artist who became an Australian national, went back to Beijing for some art exhibitions and in his home, when it came to be the anniversary of June 4th, they had a meeting and there was no right to assemble there. He got locked up and thrown into a detention house. So freedom of association, including the right to join labor unions. Uh, we've just had a very good conference in Nanjing I mentioned earlier, but certain topics were not on the table, especially the right to form a free labor union. Collective bargaining, of course, is another very controversial topic. There's always a question of what you're free to talk about in an academic forum. Uh, you have the notorious document number nine that many of you have heard about that made it uh, impossible even to talk about constitutionalism or the need for an independent judiciary. At the same time, you have the fourth plenary session of the Chinese Communist Party, which said we're now gonna have a real system under law. So there's a lot of inconsistency now, a lot of conflict, a lot of nebu uh, maodun, uh, sort of internal contradictions on the one hand. Uh, the party policy couldn't be clearer that the party controls everything and the legal system had better march to the party's tune. Uh, at the same time, you have doctrine coming out that says fajr, uh, and fajr meaning control of government, not just legal system, uh, should be uh, implemented. Well, I could go on with the right to vote take part in elections by, and here's one for Hong Kong, by universal and equal suffrage, as well as secret ballot, guaranteeing the free expression of the will of the electorate. So uh, this is, of course, uh, very depressing because since Xi Jinping has come in, there seems to be less room for freedom of expression, association, assembly, uh, et cetera, as well as for the role of lawyers in the legal profession to try to uh, protect people. So we come back to the question, why did they sign up? And what does any country think when it signs the ICCPR and thinks about ratification? Does it do it in order to gain soft power? Uh, does it do it because everybody is doing it? Does it do it because they know they can take many years to ratify after signing? Does it do it because when they have to report to the Committee on Human Rights in Geneva periodically, uh, they can waffle, uh, they can present what progress they've made but largely promise future reforms, they can lie about it, they can misrepresent, distort, uh, what are they relying on? Uh, it's an interesting question. China could ratify uh, this document with the kinds of reservations and declarations and understandings that the U.S. did when it ratified. But I think the problems are so fundamental, as I've indicated, that they know it would be a farce to try to ratify with all these changes and reservations that in effect would vitiate uh, any meaningful uh, commitment. Maybe in 1998 when they signed up, they thought, well, 20 years later, things will be much better. And steps have been made to try to put China in line for meaningful ratification. That was why they got rid of re-education through labor. Laodong Jiaoyang, which was a form of very arbitrary detention uh, with no legal formal process 
of the criminal justice type. But the fact is, of course, China has many other forms of administrative detention. And the most blatant is the one I started out by mentioning, the Shuangwei, the double designation. The party's ability to put you away. Uh, so why did they do this? I asked one of our former American diplomats who used to be in charge of human rights for the State Department in 1998 why China did this, and he said it was all part of a diplomatic deal. The U.S. had prepared a resolution that looked like it was going to pass the U.N. Uh, General Assembly, uh, condemning China for human rights violations. China tried to stop it, and they made a deal. The U.S. would withdraw the resolution if China would sign the ICCPR. And they did it as part of a short-run political uh, gesture, probably thinking for any of the reasons I've previously cited that it wasn't such a big deal, it wasn't going to be a huge uh, mistake. But here we are so many years later with a grim prospect for China getting its house in order with respect to freedoms of expression and religion, with respect to the basic rights to avoid arbitrary detention, so that it will eventually ratify. So I give you uh, a, a really poor report card at this point on the PRC's preparation, despite a number of steps being taken, despite the good faith efforts of tens of thousands of people, even in the police, and of course in the procuracy, and certainly in the courts, and in the legal profession, uh, and in the law teachers who were so influential, or used to be, in China. Nevertheless, I can't give you much hope that this document is going to be implemented in the mainland. When you look at Taiwan, it's just an entirely different situation. I first went to Taiwan in 1961, just before I came to Hong Kong on that uh, strange mission. And of course, Taiwan was just like the mainland. It was a Leninist-type military political dictatorship under Chiang Kai-shek, and fear prevailed. Uh, and it was that way until the late 80s. But what we've seen since 1987 is a revolution of a peaceful, significant nature with respect to all the rights involved uh, in the ICCPR. The irony is Taiwan has not been permitted to ratify or to deposit its ratification with the UN because it's no longer in the UN. It was replaced by the PRC, as I said, in 1971. And yet Taiwan knows that its people want the protections of this document. And Taiwan also knows that its security may depend on its ability to demonstrate that it has developed into a democratic, rule of law, human rights protecting society. The US people are uncertain about whether they would go to the defense of Taiwan, but if they do, it would be because it's no longer a Chiang Kai-shek dictatorship. But it's a very impressive, if small, population of 23 million people who have demonstrated that even though you're of Chinese descent, you're capable of creating a democratic society that still has lots of problems, but is working like other democratic societies to provide greater freedom of expression and greater protection against arbitrary detention. And Taiwan has done something very imaginative. Because they were not allowed to deposit the ratification, they nevertheless went ahead, ratified this treaty and its companion treaty, and they made it all part of their domestic law. And they were confronted with the problem that 
if they had been allowed into the covenant system, they would have to go to Geneva and face the Committee on Human Rights and have a periodic monitoring of the extent to which they have implemented the rights that they have been committed to protect. But since they're not in the UN, they can't go and demonstrate to the world what they've done. So they've created their own international Committee on Human Rights. They call it the Committee on uh, Reviewing Human Rights. They started four years ago. I appointed 10 people from 10 different countries. I took part uh, in the first review four years ago. It was a very moving experience to sit there for three days and hear the government reports. And then the NGO people challenge the government reports and then work with a group of experts to recommend improvements in the system. And now we're about to have, beginning Monday, uh, the second uh, human rights review, uh, four years after the first. And this is an imaginative uh, thing. I think my former student, Ma Yingzhou, who properly takes credit for many of the cross-strait agreements that have been made under his leadership, hasn't done enough to take credit for the human rights progress that has been made uh, in Taiwan uh, during his administration, because they have something to be proud of, uh, and they need to advertise it more. I think there's a lesson here for Hong Kong also. There needs to be much greater education about what does it mean uh, when the basic law, Article 39, protects people in Hong Kong uh, under this uh, covenant. Uh, and are there imaginative ways to use that protection? And is there any way to get the UK to try to be more vigorous in getting the PRC to observe the commitment it made in the joint declaration uh, that this covenant would apply to Hong Kong, even though it doesn't apply uh, to uh, the mainland. So you have different situations in the mainland, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and even in the United States with regard to this piece of paper. And we have to ask, is this paper 50 years later worth all the fuss? Uh, is it just, you know, kung hua, as the Chinese would say, empty talk? Uh, or does it have some meaningful potential for enforcement, for implementation, for inspiring people, uh, even if it's not adopted uh, in the mainland? Does its availability and the fact that so many Chinese scholars have written about how the PRC government could in good faith uh, ratify this uh, convention. I think we shouldn't ignore the aspirational aspects of this, uh, and we shouldn't ignore the importance of this document and others that China has already ratified for providing answers to those who say, China is not part of the world in this respect, China is distinctive. It only has to deal with its own situation. Uh, it's not affected by universal rights. And those rights are Western tools being used by governments that really don't want to do China any favors. Uh, and that's a standard argument against the use of human rights. And often it is true that some governments have, and the United States certainly has, made a selective uh, use of documents like that, uh, not making too much mention, for example, of what takes place in Saudi Arabia, but often pointing out the facts of life uh, in China. Human rights is a tool, uh, often, of the political struggle, but it's much more than that. And I think uh, we owe it not only to ourselves in our respective countries, but to the people who are working to make a better life for 1.4 billion people in the world's largest population.
uh, to do what we can to understand uh, what the provisions of this treaty provide and what the obligations of governments are and how those provisions can be used to improve the quality of life for everybody. As I went around China this last week and saw so many people living in what seemed to be highly improved conditions economically from those I witnessed when I first went to China in 1972, it, it seemed like we're dealing with two different countries and you wonder, a country that has accomplished so much in the last four decades, why does it have to have an essentially uncivilized way of treating people who have different opinions from the dominant political group. Uh, what would it cost uh, if you gave people who were locked up a hearing before a court? I've sat in Taipei courts in Taiwan, and I've seen defendants or suspects who've been locked up have the opportunity to go to court and to challenge a decision to keep them locked up and have a lawyer with them and make the prosecution lawyer show up for the hearing. How damaging would that be to the PRC? And wouldn't that improve uh, the quality of life uh, for at least the minority of people who are not now protected by this great document? Of course, that might lead to less ability to punish people who want to speak out and that might force the government to allow greater freedom of speech and opinion than it thinks wise. But I think that would be very desirable and it would be good to see the PRC have the confidence of its many accomplishments. Well, that's just my thought. Uh, I welcome uh, your criticisms, suggestions, ideas. Uh, so uh, we have a half hour and uh, I come here because you're a very informed audience. Oh, thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, you have given us a, a very um, detailed um, uh, survey of um, the applicability or non-applicability of various provisions of the ICPR in China today. Um, and also uh, you have given, a given us a comparative perspective uh, with regard to um, the human rights uh, situations in Taiwan uh, and Hong Kong. Um, we will uh, have some discussion. Uh, members of the audience are invited to give comments or questions. Um, maybe we'll collect a few questions or comments first. Uh, Whatever. So first, first, round, <laughs> first round of uh, questions and comments. Uh, Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Cohen. Uh, my name is Chen, and uh, I'm right now a student at Harvard Law. And uh, before that, I was a Chinese diplomat, also dealing with human rights. So on ICCPR, the international community has always been pushing Chinese governments on, ratific on its ratification. And uh, the Chinese governments uh, uh, has always been trying to downplay the importance of human rights in both bi bilateral and multilateral uh, foreign relations. And uh, in doing so, it in, for example, it invented the human rights dialogue in order to prevent the high level uh, to, uh, officials from mentioning human rights issues. It says uh, we can talk about human rights in those uh, uh, human rights dialogues so, so that you don't raise it in, in the presidential visits, for example. And uh, actually one reason that um, Beijing doesn't like uh, Hillary Clinton is because she is quite, she takes very strong position on human rights against China. And uh, um, from this perspective, uh, thinking about the, the, the newly elected uh, president, uh, uh, Donald Trump, what do you think? How do you think this will impact the the U.S.-China uh, exchanges and interactions on human rights in general, and maybe more specifically on ICCPR ratification? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll reserve that. Uh, reserve the answer to a few minutes later. Uh, anyone? Yes. 
Thank you. Anyone from this side? Uh, not. Uh, yes, this Professor Michael Palmer. Negative. You're a little negative on why China signed the ICCPR in, in uh, 1998. We can talk about that in a moment. Yes? Hi. Um, Jerry, uh, um, uh, there were some speculations a few years ago uh, that uh, Beijing um, they still refuse to ratify um, the ICCPR, but signed it in 1998. It was kind of related uh, to its bid to do the Beijing Olympics around like late 90s. Uh, and I don't know whether you agree with that kind of speculation. It's related to how it tried to have a, uh, have rise the international arena and uh, promising something actually they don't really subscribe to. They just want to have some window dressing um, practice to do so. Thank you. So maybe we'll now invite Professor Cohen to respond to the four questions or comments. One relates to U.S.-China uh, Human Rights Dialogue and, and the new president. Um, the other relates to uh, Hong Kong, Article 23. And then uh, the, the signing of the ICCPR by China and its refusal to ratify and so on. So, Jerry? Yeah, of course. Uh, no one I know is brave enough to predict what Mr. Trump will do. <laughs> about anything. Uh, and uh, he's a blatant violation so far of our ethical rules for how government should be run. Just this question of the treatment of his son-in-law, whom I am uh, bound to say is a NYU Law School graduate. <laughs> I, he never took my course. Uh, <laughs> but I wish he had, but uh, I should say about, you know, I wish the son-in-law would retire from his new job in government and would retire from the business world and start writing novels. And the first novel he could write as a sequel to the great book by Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises, is The Son-in-Law Also Rises. But seriously, we don't know what uh, Trump is likely to do. Uh, I don't think he's going to try to undo the U.S. ratification of the uh, ICCPR, but he may commit all kinds of other violations of our own law. We have no way of knowing. Uh, and I don't envy the Chinese government or any government that has to try to have a negotiation uh, with this fellow. Now, expectations are so low that I think it's likely he has nowhere to go but up. <laughs> and in some respects that we can't predict, he may not be as bad as he started out to be or has professed to be. So I can't give you a serious answer. Uh, all I can say is after a period of shock and mourning, huge number of people in the United States are prepared to do battle. We can't just lie down and play dead. We have to work harder than ever to use civil society and the political process. We'll have congressional elections in less than two years. Uh, we've got to do what we can to curb him. And he has within his government people of varying views, some very good people and many awful people, and many in the middle, and they are going to have the darndest fights about reaching agreement on virtually anything. So we don't know what he's going to do. And uh, maybe the most hopeful thing he said is at one point, he said he's willing to negotiate, make a deal with North Korea. <laughs> 
If so, he's one of the few people in the American public life who's willing to take a new look at North Korea. I'm a member of a very small group that says we have to have a radically different, far more welcoming, accepting uh, policy toward North Korea, despite the difficulties uh, North Koreans are. As uh, Professor Chun knows, twice in this law school building, uh, we have had uh, week-long seminars that I've run to train North Koreans in international business law. And if Trump is willing to go against the will of Congress and his own party and say, let's take negotiation with North Korea seriously, and this is a serious human rights question, of course, as well as military security question, that could be interesting. But you don't know. The man from day to day says different things, and uh, it's a bewildering process. But all we can do is work as hard as we can to have a rational policy toward China in all respects, not just human rights, because that isn't our only issue with China, of course. And we need to cooperate with China in many, many respects. So I don't know. Now, Article 23, that was a very good question, because uh, we were discussing this uh, before we started this meeting with a few of the faculty, and maybe they'll want to say something about it, but uh, it may be that uh, the protection of the ICCPR will be useful in opposing any attempt to have new legislation implementing Article 23. And this involves the question of who interprets the meaning of the ICCPR for purposes of Hong Kong? Does the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress have a right to in interpret it? Can they overrule the opinion of the Human Rights Committee interpreting uh, the ICCPR, the group of specialists, and what the meaning of the treaty is? I just think people here in Hong Kong should pay greater attention to the potential and to the problems of trying to invoke the commitments. And I'd like to see the British government be much more active in saying it to China to the extent it violates the ICCPR. This was a treaty made between the two governments and one party certainly has the right to protest if it feels the other party hasn't properly implemented its promises. Uh, that leads to a question about promises. Governments are always making promises. And to some extent, China is a victim of its prominence. You don't hear people ask, is Indonesia carrying out its obligations under international human rights treaties? Even though Indonesia is a very important country, more important than Vanuatu, for example, it's not subjected to the degree of scrutiny that China is subjected because China is so important. So to some extent, you could say the international process isn't very good at criticizing or prompting countries with respect to their obligations under treaties, except in certain cases. Because China controls 1.4 billion people, it's a more important question now. It observes its commitments. And I think, like the United States, it should be held uh, to the standard that is articulated and not ignored. I like the fact the Chinese government annually now publishes a critique of the US human rights policies and defects. I think it's a it's a helpful thing. We should have the benefit of that, and the U.S. should see how the world sees us. I think one of the most profound things ever written was by uh, the Scottish uh, poet, uh, who's, uh, Robert Burns, who said, Oh, would the Lord this gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. And uh, we need more of that, and I think the Chinese human rights uh, you could say it's hypocritical, et cetera, but it's, it's useful to point out to the U.S. how far we are from fully implementing our various uh, commitments. Maybe Mr. Trump 
will reject the world community's values. And there are some people in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party also uh, who really believe big powers shouldn't be subject to the same standards as the rest of the world. And the US and China are the two most powerful powers. Now, it was said, I'm a little negative. Well, I don't know what that means. It's obvious I've been very negative uh, about China, but does that mean the facts that I have referred to are false? Is this part of the fake facts to which we're constantly uh, exposed these days? Uh, some people say to me, gee, you're getting more conservative than you used to be. I said, I don't think so, although maybe I'm disillusioned after 50 odd years of working for reforms uh, in China as well as elsewhere. But I don't think so. I think that when the facts change, I think John Maynard Keynes said this, when the facts change, you have to change your evaluation. I had an article the other day in the uh, Financial Times Chinese newspaper. Uh, really refers to the experience I had living and working in China, 1979 to 81. And that was a different time. That was a time, newness of hope, culture revolution that ended the victims of the anti-rightist movement to the extent they were still around were being rehabilitated. Your attitude at that point is somewhat different from 30 or 40 years later when you see, despite some continuing progress, the leadership in China's dominant view, although they're not consistent entirely, is negative. It's negative toward universal values. You know, a leading Chinese specialist played a role in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That was before the communist era, of course. but. Uh, the PRC has uh, done some notable things in improving situations since the Cultural Revolution. But one has to call a fact a fact. But it's certainly, uh, I don't like depressing people or coming in. I go around the various law schools in America whenever I see the graduate students from China. I think I leave them depressed. And I try to tell them I don't want to. They have to recognize the facts and then decide what role they want to play. And I think they can play an important role. Uh, I had an amusing sort of experience in October at Yale Law School, which is my alma mater. Uh, they've recently got a $30 million gift uh, from uh, Joseph Tsai, a Taiwanese who's a graduate of Yale College and Law School and who's made a fortune with Alibaba, runs the South China Morning Post, at least from a high perch, and he's given $30 million. And I was invited to go up there to the celebration. And I had to say to the visiting scholars from China that the Yale Law School may be a very dangerous place for them because I recounted how many of the Chinese lawyers and uh, human rights advocates I have met for the first time when they were visiting scholars at the Yale Law School and who were now in prison or disbarred or exiled from their country. And I said, they come to our US Asia Law Institute at NYU, we're not a dangerous place because Many of the people who come to us from China have already been imprisoned, disbarred, <laughs> and exiled. Yes. Uh, um, Nicholas Becklin from uh, Amnesty. We do scrutinize uh, Indonesia, don't worry. Uh, like you, Jerry, I'm, I'm an optimist, um, and I think in the case of legal reform in China, it has always been a case of where you look. Uh, there have been areas of progress, there were areas of um, perhaps less uh, progress, and of course there is uh, 
Um, whenever a case is deemed politically sensitive, they, as you uh, described, they throw the book out of the window. Um, even under Xi Jinping, uh, we saw what was probably a major step forward, the abolition of Lao Tiao. Uh, so that's one more system of administrative detention uh, that has been struck off uh, after the custody and repatriation and so on. Um, but perhaps the big question I have for, for you is, um, is China still on a path of convergence with um, global international norms and ways of running uh, a legal system? Or has it reached a point where not only it's not interested in the lofty human rights standards uh, listed in the ICCPR, I think that's quite clear that they are not interested, uh, but that with the um, buildup of all this national, national security legislation, which has been a major endeavor of the Xi Jinping administration and comes directly against any kind of uh, hopeful effort to build uh, the rule of law. Um, what, where are we at the crossroad here? Is, is there still convergence and steps in areas uh, and legal reform progressing and hope that all this maybe blossoms when the big winter uh, is, um, is, is behind us? Or are we definitely seeing China drifting away um, and, and what does it mean for Chinese society if China is not a country that is interested in being governed according to law, if not uh, by rule of law? It's a mixed picture. Uh, you can look to certain areas and see real progress. And of course, criminal justice isn't the only uh, area to look to and assessing a nation's legal progress. I happen to think it's the most important, which is what I focus on, but it isn't the only one. And even with respect to criminal justice, as I said, progress is being made. Just this morning, my colleague Ira Belkin and I were talking, and he properly pointed out that many of the Chinese defense lawyers are learning a huge amount about how to use the existing system with all its limitations in a much more sophisticated way uh, than they did before, and with many of them managing to stay out of jail. Uh, and that's the question. I remember in March of 2006, sitting in the Cary Center Hotel restaurant at a round table with around a dozen human rights lawyers. And uh, uh, most of them favored discretion, trying to cope with the system as best they can, even though it meant fighting with one arm tied behind the other. Uh, at the table was the great Gao Zhisheng, who uh, I admired immensely. But he took the other position. He said, we can't just operate within the existing technicalities and just try to Im improve the technical parts of the law. We have to recognize there will never be justice in a fair legal system until the Communist Party yields its monopoly of power. And he said it with a passion that reminded me of uh, the late Kim Dae-jung when he was a human rights activist in South Korea and I was his great friend. He had the same mixture of religious fervor, the same Jeffersonian belief that the tree of liberty occasionally has to be nourished by the blood of patriots, uh, the same uh, Catholic uh, belief uh, in uh, universality, importance of freedom. And I, I, I admired him, but I said, you know, if you go on talking like that, you aren't going to be on the street in six months' time, you won't be any good to anybody. And of course, uh, he chose martyrdom. And they neutered him, even a great man. 
and he's now close to being a vegetable, just living in the rural areas, and he's not able to help anybody in his family had to flee to the United States. And that's true uh, in so many cases. I do see progress. I think a lot of things going on. Legal education, although the party is now trying to limit it, for decades, legal education has fostered what they call Western constitutional, I call universal human rights model legal education until recently has been dominated by the Anglo-American example in China. And law professors have played an important role. I wish they would speak out more often about practice rather than hold on to their ability to influence rules, legislation, pieces of paper. But Chinese law professors play an important role, and they're still doing it, even though to varying degrees their teaching, their publication, etc., cetera, uh, are restricted. I just discovered uh, last week a great sensitivity now. I was surprised on uh, two days ago, a new magazine appeared in China uh, called Practical Jurisprudence. Uh, I think it's Zhongguo Yingyou Fashue, and it's sponsored by the Supreme People's Court. And to my surprise, they asked me to contribute an article to the inaugural issue. And my first reaction was, you wouldn't possibly publish anything I could write. <laughs> it's a waste of time. But then I reconsidered and I thought, I'll write about history. I'll write about the period of great hope when Deng Xiaoping came in and they started to revive the legal system, late 78, 79, 80, 81. It was an exciting time to be in China. And I wrote something for them and the editors liked it, except they wanted to censor a few things I'd said. And it was the most innocuous thing. I mean, it's not like I was condemning even uh, the pre-Deng Xiaoping era, but I did refer to the anti-rightist movement, Fan Yo Pa Yundu. I did refer to the proletarian cultural revolution, Wan Hua Da Ming, and they said, we'd like you to take those terms out. And I said, why? They said, some people would feel it's inconvenient. It makes them uncomfortable to read those terms. Now, that's nonsense in terms of what's going on in China. It's a case of editorial people being too sensitive. I wasn't criticizing the Cultural Revolution or the anti-rightist movement. I was simply referring, these are facts that occurred in Chinese history. Well, I was discouraged about it, so I published it in the FT Chinese, which uh, is a very, I admire them. They're the, the only uh, English language newspaper allowed to have a Chinese version published in China now, only significant one at least. So, but it shows how sensitive uh, everything now is and how reluctant people are to make decisions uh, of any nature, and especially to speak out for human rights. But this will pass. 1968, I published my first book about criminal process in the People's Republic of China. Of course, Cultural Revolution was at its height, but it was obvious that it wasn't going to last forever, and that China would rebel against that experience as it has. Uh, and I think, uh, I think on. On this, in this respect, Xi Jinping has gone too far, and there will be a reaction, because I know many, many people in the Chinese legal system who don't agree, they can't speak out. Uh, even people who work for the party apparatus are unhappy, uh, but they're in a minority right now when it comes to power, but their day will come. But in the meantime, we have to work toward improving the system to the extent feasible. It reminds me in a way of uh, Taiwan in the 60s or 70s. A lot of people were working for democratic law reform in the worst days of Chiang Kai-shek. And it provided a basis when political conditions changed in the mid 80s to rather smoothly 
uh, with surprisingly little upheaval, implement the values that they had been working to promote. And that, a lot of that is going on in China today, and we shouldn't ignore it, and we shouldn't abandon the people. I don't like the attitude of some people in America and elsewhere who say, God, these people are hopeless, and uh, they just don't want to continue to cooperate with China, and they often use the foreign NGO law or the national security law or whatever law has recently come out uh, as an excuse for going elsewhere. China is too important and there are too many good people there working for values that we all would share. So I'm a little bit negative at the moment, of course, but I'm also an optimist. Uh, as uh, you say, I, my first job in America, I worked for Chief Justice Earl Warren. He had been governor of California for 12 years before going to the Supreme Court at a time when California had its maximum development and prosperity. And he said California wasn't built by pessimists. And uh, I think it's important to recognize reality, but to maintain the faith and working toward mm -hmm kind of future we would like to see China share and we would like to see better in our own jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a matter of faith and uh, uh, I hope that many of you will uh, continue to share it and I'm always grateful for the chance to come here and at least uh, give you my thoughts whether they're positive or negative. <laughs> So thank you, Jerry. I think the, those I regard those as your concluding remarks since uh, the time for this lecture is up. Uh, uh, what, what Jerry just said reminds me of uh, what he said uh, when he taught the Chinese law course at Harvard in 1981 uh, to 82. Uh, he said that um, if he didn't believe in progress or the possibility, possibility of progress, he would not be in this particular field. Uh, do you remember saying that? So I'm glad to, to hear that uh, after uh, all these years, uh, three, more than three decades, uh, he's still an optimist. Uh, uh, he is always a great friend of the Chinese people. Uh, he might not be a great friend of all the Chinese leaders, but uh, in my view, <laughs> He has always been a great fan of the Chinese people and uh, uh, we in Hong Kong and many people in mainland China and Taiwan also uh, share this view. Well, I uh, hope we don't have convergence because Trump <laughs> takes the U.S. backward. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you to all of you for attending this seminar. Uh, thank you to Kavita Cohen. So we all look forward to uh, seeing Professor Cohen again uh, some, sometime somewhere, uh, ideally here in Hong Kong, of course, but uh, maybe some of you will go.